Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Matthias Depka, who is a research, research professor in the Department of Economics at Northwestern University. His research spans many areas, including parenting, inequality, and their economics, economic effects on society. Welcome, Matthias. Thanks for having me. Sure, yeah. So I want to start with um, one of your recent books entitled Love, Money, and Parenting how economics explains the way we raise our kids. And uh, the book uses the tools of economics to understand why and how child rearing uh, practices vary so much over time and across societies. Um, You argue and document with uh, data analysis that the growth of intensive parenting, um, you know, such as helicopter parenting, tiger moms, et cetera, it's not just a new fashion, but it's a response of loving parents to a trend of growing of income inequality. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's an odd connection. So you want to talk a bit about uh, the hypothesis and the data that you used and what conclusions you reached? Yes, uh, I, w- I would love to. So this uh, trend in parenting that we're talking about is documented in many different places. You can see it in time use data, for example, where you see that uh, in the 1970s, most parents were relatively uh, relaxed. You know, they uh, watched over their kids, uh, made sure they came home at night, but it wasn't really the same intensity as now. Whereas now you uh, see many news stories about helicopter parents, about snowplow parents, the new, <laughs> new type of parent every week, where yeah. uh, parents are super engaged, um, also uh, sign up their kids for many activities, are there to make sure everything goes right. So they have uh, a lot more effort. We can see in the time use that the, just the time that parents uh, spend interacting with their children has grown enormously. And it also comes with a heightened uh, anxiety and this uh, perception of, uh, of pressure. Right. And, uh, and, and one, one reason we wanted to, to uh, address this is that this is something that also really uh, happened in our own lives. You know, so, so my co-author, Fabrizio Villibotti, is Italian. He grew up in uh, northern Italy in the 70s. I'm German. He grew up uh, in mm. Germany. And mm-hmm. our own childhoods were very much uh, like this more relaxed, permissive example. So my own parents, uh, you know, they gave us food. They made sure we, uh, <laughs> but that was it. Yeah. You know, for example, homework is something that was for kids. My parents would never have thought about uh, checking our homework or sitting there helping us uh, with those tasks. You know, whereas uh, mm-hmm. now that's quite different. And uh, and, and uh, after school, you know, school was over like at one p.m. and uh, from essentially lunch until nightfall we could do what we want and, and uh, play soccer go to friends our parents would know where we are it's just uh, your own your own life your own independent uh, childhood and that was actually a very fun way to grow up uh, to grow up so we enjoyed that and so we were kind of expecting i think uh, that we would be very similar in our own parenting choices later on and now we arrive here you know uh, 40 years later and it turns out that in our own parenting we turn out to be a lot more like other parents now are. So we are more intense. 
we do pay more attention. We make sure the homework gets done. We sign them up for activities. We have turned into something like a helicopter parent ourselves. You know? <laughs> and, uh, okay. and that's, of course, uh, a bit of a, a personal surprise. Now, now how, what, should, what should you make of this? If you read uh, the newspapers on this stuff, it is often this notion that somehow parents have lost the right way. That there's something wrong with parenting that we have kind of gotten too concerned and that if, uh, if parents could only relax, that well, then maybe we could get to a better outcome and more relaxed uh, childhoods. Mm. But, but this view that parents are doing it wrong, this is really what conflicts with our professional uh, views as, as economists. You know? and, yeah. uh, and this is where the economics comes in. Because economics is a social science Social sciences want to understand how people make decisions. And the usual approach that economists take is to, is to start from the assumption, from the view, that people more or less know what they are doing, that they're pursuing certain objectives, that their behavior can be understood as a broadly rational, a broadly purposeful reaction to the environment that they face, the incentives that are provided by their environment. Yeah. So this economic uh, perspective would suggest, well, there's a reason why behavior has changed. Okay, so you, you observe these differences across countries and perhaps across time as well in specific countries. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're hypothesizing that there has to be something that is driving it. Exactly. Um, and, and so, 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 one of the, uh, so, so one of the factors you're looking at I'm looking at the chart you have uh, you have in your article. You have sort of a correlation drawn between income inequality, which is on the x-axis, and, um, and and sort of the the parents praising hard work <laughs> of students on the y-axis. And you have different countries here: Sweden, all the way to the the bottom left. Uh, low income in inequality. Parents really don't bother that much with kids. And you have China to, to the right upper corner, uh, high income inequality and parents very much involved with the kids. Uh, I can remember, Matthias, you know, when I was growing up in India, uh, the situation was, and I think I still believe it is the case, uh, it's very similar to what you might, uh, you might find in China. And it's, it, it's not only uh, kids growing up, but also... You know the, and I guess we will we'll talk a little bit about it. The options uh, or the choices those kids have uh, when they grow up. So the education itself seems to be sort of designed in a very prescriptive fashion too. I don't know if that is something that you looked at, mm -hmm. uh, but going back to this correlation between income inequality and parents' involvement, um, can we really draw any causality from it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what, what is your what is your feeling? Yes, uh, th that is the big question. We were drawn to this um, hypothesis that inequality matters to some extent, just based on the observation that we know that in countries like the United States, inequality grew tremendously over the last few decades. But it also uh, rhymes with again personal experience, where you realize as a parent today in the United States that uh, a lot of the stress that you're under comes from. Uh, this uh, great desire to have well-educated children. And, and why do you really want your children to do well in education? Well, because parents know that it matters tremendously for outcomes. You know, parents know mm -hmm. that if you complete a college education, that you have a very good prospect to make a secure income and be, be well off, have a safe path into the middle class. If you uh, do not finish college nowadays, that path is no longer as secure. There's a very large gap in outcomes depending on uh, how well you do in education, which is one aspect uh, of inequality, which is driving this long run trend. You know, so, mm -hmm. so I think speaking to parents today, it is quite clear that that plays a big role in their thinking. And uh, again, thinking back to uh, what we experienced earlier, um, you know, when I was little, inequality was very low in Germany. It didn't matter mm -hmm. that much if you go to university or start an apprenticeship at a, at a small company or an industrial plant. And so I think parents didn't perceive that same pressure. Yeah, so, so the, the more uncertain uh, the outcomes are proxied here by, let's say, income inequality, mm -hmm. uh, there appears to be more involvement of the parents on the premise that their involvement actually, uh, I guess they don't believe it reduces uncertainty because it's a property of the system mm -hmm. 
but rather it it um, it reduces uh, the the probabilities of bad outcomes for the kids. Exactly. Is that what they're believing? Exactly. You think that you that you're able to to um, you know push your kid a bit more and uh, make them. Uh, end up a little higher on that on the ranking, that social ranking. And if inequality is high, then then that is something that weighs relatively more on your mind compared to other things like, you know, having uh, your child having just a relaxed and, uh, and happy time. And now, of course, it's just a hypothesis you asked before about the data. So to uh, to get some sense if this is causal, you no, know, we have to look a little bit uh, deeper. Ideally, you would yeah. like to do a controlled experiment, but we can't really do this with uh, parents and children. We can't really, you know, force parents to uh, uh, not spend much time with their kids or, or be very authoritarian. <laughs> but we can look yeah. at variation. And so, so one thing that is helpful is what you mentioned, this cross-country variation, where you see that in the United States today, um, and, and so we use data from this uh, survey, it's called the World Value Survey, which is quite nice because it captures many countries and asks uh, people about attitudes in many different directions. And this question we are using comes from a set of questions about what values are important to emphasize in raising children. And as you mentioned, in the United States, uh, about two thirds of parents say that working hard is an important value for kids. And if I talk to parents I know, they would all agree you know, that the kids should apply themselves and work hard in school. But then you go to Sweden uh, and there's only 11%. There, in fact, most parents uh, think that uh, pushing your kid hard like we do here in the United States is a bad idea. They think it's bad for kids. They should just be free and play outside. My co-author lived in Sweden and so he has many uh, colorful stories to uh, talk, tell about this. And, mm. Yeah. yeah. No, no, so, so I, you know, I'm always interested when I see a chart that has Sweden, Norway, Finland mm -hmm. on one side of it at United States, Russia, and China right. on, the, on the other side. Uh, and it sort of makes intuitive sense. But, but the question remains in my mind, Matthias, and, and um, see if you can yeah. think about this. Uh, so we know that the inequality is lower in Scandinavia. We know the inequality is higher in the US, uh, China um, countries. Um, but is it is it because in other words, in other words you know, it's a chicken and egg problem. Mm -hmm. You know, did the did the patenting um, style uh, create an inequality, or the inequality driving the patenting right. style? That's the part that I exactly. Have difficulty and with. and you're completely right. One should always be suspicious of uh, a chart with Scandinavia on one side and China or Asia on the other side because <laughs> there are cultural differences too. And we're not denying yeah. that those also matter. It's it's a, it's a question of of relative uh, magnitude. And uh, so, so uh, you know, what is the, the evidence that there's at least uh, some causal impact from the inequality to parenting? Um, well, first of all, we, we point out the changes over time that uh, you can see yeah. um, you know, in the United States, we had much more relaxed parents in the past. Even in Sweden, you know, parents used to be very authoritarian a couple of generations ago. If you talk to older mm -hmm. Swedish people, they had a very different memory of their, of their childhood. But we can also do this more formally. So, so one empirical analysis we do is to look at this data but uh, we uh, look at changes within countries over time as opposed to just variation across countries. And then you see very clearly yeah. that within a given country, so, so not comparing countries, but if inequality goes up within a given country, parents become more intense. For example, more parents uh, report that the hard work is important. In countries, uh, there's just a, a few examples of that. In countries that have a lower inequality, it goes the other way around. You know, for example, Spain had a decline in inequality. Uh, over the last few decades, and there, in fact, parents have gotten somewhat more permissive. So, uh, so, so this is a, a stronger piece of evidence because it doesn't really rely on changes uh, on variation across very different cultures. Right, right. Yeah, I, I was also thinking that you know, again, if you think about Sweden, Norway, Finland, uh, they have their education systems are much more advanced. They always come on top uh, in most uh, most metrics. Uh, and that's not the case uh, for the U.S. And, and China, presumably. I don't know much about China. But um, so, you know, sort of the education level uh, of these cohorts are different, mm -hmm. right? Aggregate education levels are quite different. As well. Right. Uh, they're, they're different, although I would argue that if you compare the United States uh, and, uh, say, Sweden, the difference is yeah. less so in the level as opposed to the inequality within the education system. 
You know, so, so if you look, for example, at PISA scores, uh, which is this international study of student achievement in, in math and uh, languages. So we know that in, the, uh, in these uh, achievement tests, the US is kind of in the middle of the pack. It's not terrible. It's not at the, at, the, at the top. It's in the middle of the richer countries. Sweden, in fact, is quite similar. It's also in the middle of the pack. It's not really excelling at uh, having the highest, say, math scores in the developed world. And that would be countries like uh, South Korea, also Finland, by the way. But uh, but what Sweden does have is uh, a very equitable education system where the education you get is not very dependent on your social background, uh, where there is broad access to universities. Public universities are essentially free and they're also a fairly uniform quality. And that is quite different from here, where we have at the top track, uh, perhaps some of the best education you can get. If you go to an elite private school, if you go to one of these uh, you know, Ivy League uh, colleges, uh, you do get an uh, amazing education in the United States, but that's for a small slice of the population. You know, if you go to, uh, to, to the bottom end, it's a quite different story. And so this uh, inequality in educational opportunities is also one aspect of this inequality, of this, of this bottleneck feature in a country like the United States that really raises the pr uh, pressure in parenting decisions. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, it's impossible to run this, as you said, uh, to run an experiment. Yeah, the ideal experiment would be to, to take two systems and you say, you said the initial conditions of uh, inequality and then look at right. behavior. Or you said behavior and look at inequality over time, but <laughs> it's an experiment mm -hmm. we cannot run. Uh, but uh, I, I found the other chart in the paper um, very interesting as well. So here you're looking at, again, x-axis has income in inequality and y-axis has uh, parents praising imagination. And so it is not just, you know, uh, the, the first one we looked at is really parents praising hard work, uh, meaning the proxy there is really the amount of time that you're spending, uh, I guess. Uh, and the second one is really about sort of the quality uh, of uh, parent involvement. And then there you see sort of a negative relationship mm -hmm. between the two. Right? Yes, and that's a great observation. And, and it's very much uh, in the um, you know, economic way of thinking, because uh, as economists, we think of trade-offs. You know, if you do more of one thing, you have to do a, a little less of another. And I think this shows very clearly one yeah. of the trade-offs that you, that you face. Imagination, you know, having a kid that's uh, creative and uses the mind in novel and interesting ways, I think uh, most parents anywhere would think, well, that's in principle something that is uh, desirable. You know? But the question is, uh, how, how high is it on your list of priority to, to uh, foster creativity and imagination as opposed to other things? And here, I think what's happening is that if you're in a system that really emphasizes performance, you know, say tons of homework, high stakes tests, you know, if you think of, uh, you know, we have the SATs uh, in places like uh, South Korea and China, it's even uh, more intense because these university admission tests you have to do really determine a large part of your life. So if you're in that kind of system, then uh, emphasizing uh, just uh, learning and getting the math done is the most important thing. And the other stuff falls a bit by the wayside. Whereas in a place like uh, Sweden, as we say, you know, this, uh, this pressure to uh, do well on the test is not the same. In fact, the tests come in very late in the educational system. And, and so there's a lot more room to emphasize uh, other aspects that are also important, such as imagination. Also, independence is another one like that. Hmm. Yeah, I was also wondering, Matthias, yeah, is there any data that, that sort of look at, looks at, um, uh, you know, innovation um, yeah. per mm -hmm. capita in these countries, right? So if, if uh, I mean, this is not not what you're uh, exploring, but I, I found that, you know, sort of interesting to think about, uh, is there any positive correlation between quality of parent involvement, in this case, praising imagination of kids, uh, getting them to really think more broadly? Uh, do we see the outcomes of that behavior to be positively correlated with, you right. know, with that uh, in terms of you know, some kind of innovation per capita? Right. I think it's a super like interesting question. I, I don't know if we have the data to really uh, examine this, uh, you know, robustly right now. But I do think it's an important, uh, it's an important possibility because if you do emphasize as a parent, there's only one way. The only way to success is uh, do the math, uh, go to college, uh, finish up. You know, that, that uh, close yeah. off a certain other path. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't give you the same room to be creative. You know? and, and we do see that uh, you know, many uh, entrepreneurs, many successful 
founders of businesses uh, actually were dropouts in high school or college. You know, they, they did their own thing, followed their own dream. Um, in a place like Sweden, right. there's a lot of emphasis on working with others or cooperating, which can also be an important part of innovation. At a, at a superficial level, there's yeah. some, some evidence. So, so Sweden, for example, does not do great at math scores. They do, in fact, uh, very mm. well in terms of innovation. So if you think of the tech sector in Europe, you know, yeah. uh, Stockholm is, uh, is a bit like Silicon Valley, even though it's a small country. They're doing much better than, than bigger mm. countries in Europe. And, and so it is certainly suggestive of that link, but uh, it would take a bit more to get really hard evidence on that link. Yeah, um, I don't know if, if this is right, Matthias. So uh, there is some relationship here potentially to inequality uh, in the sense that, so suppose I you know, sort of create a, a per capita innovation a curve of some sort, right? So in the US, if, if I look at, look at it cross-sectionally, you know, th there is some, a very small group of people, let's say, I'm just mm -hmm. hypothesizing, a very small group of people that show, who show very high innovation or very small group of universities, right. as you say, um, uh, communities, et cetera, Silicon Valley, for example, show very high innovation. Uh, but we look at it cross-sectionally across the entire country, it's a totally different story. So the 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 average is so much to the right yeah. of the board, right? That is that what we see in the U.S. Uh, yes, I, I mean it's always the case that uh, you know entrepreneurship and founding businesses is a very small slice of the population, you know? and so so there is really no way to uh, to push a given child to become a successful entrepreneur. Uh, you can try to create conditions yeah. that makes entrepreneurship a bit more likely, a bit easier, uh, a bit easier to achieve. And there we do see this uh, varies uh, quite a bit across um, uh, across countries. By the way, also across groups. You know, so, so another observation is that uh, immigrants are often uh, quite uh, successful in entrepreneurship. You know, they seem to have uh, maybe the right values or attitudes, maybe because they already have some entrepreneurship in making the decision to move to a new country that, that fosters that kind of decision making. But it varies a lot and it would be certainly very valuable economically to learn more about uh, exactly where that variation comes from. Yeah, so, so if you look at Sweden again, uh, where we find, if you look at uh, Europe in general, you, you say that Sweden has higher levels of innovation. Do, do we find that Sweden is a small country? So uh, do we find that sort of uniform across the, across the country or do we see that in Well, pockets? it's uh, locally very concentrated. Uh, you know? it, yeah. It's just in big cities. Most innovation takes yeah. place in, in, in big cities. Uh, what I'm not quite sure, uh, what, what I would, would assume is that a good number of the entrepreneurs uh, were not born in Stockholm or Malmö, but, but moved there uh, over time. But, but certainly uh, having, uh, having a place where this comes together is super important. You know, that, that's one reason why Silicon Valley, even though the housing prices are off the chart, is still, you know, very relevant in today's world. Right. Okay. And so, so what's sort of the primary conclusion? Um, not just conclusion, but observations that you have from the... So, from so the, the book, book makes this point more generally, that, that we argue that you see a lot of variation yeah. in uh, parenting behavior, you know, quite uh, even going much beyond what we just talked about now, also going back in history when parents were very authoritarian, um, different parenting for boys and girls, gender differences. There's as many aspects where uh, parenting has changed tremendously over time. And the... And the point of the book is to make this broad argument that a lot of this variation can be, can be understood from the perspective of uh, incentives provided by the environment. So what is the, the message? Is first of all, nice to know that this uh, works, uh, that economics can speak to these issues. For us, it's also an issue about uh, whether maybe there's something we should, we should change. You know, because many uh, yeah. parents, uh, I think many kids too, have the, uh, have the impression that maybe we have taken this uh, intensity of parenting a bit too far. Maybe we are uh, creating children that are that are anxious, and uh, in fact, there's a very clear rise in in uh, anxiety, depression among teenagers and, and college students uh, recently. But that maybe this is a, this is a bad development. But but then our approach says, if you want to have a change, it is not about uh, telling parents they should do something different that they are that they are doing it wrong. It is about changing the environment. It's about thinking about how institutions, how we organize the education system, for example, how these institutions feed back into what uh, families do. Well, think about uh, organization of schools and private and uh, public support for different levels of colleges, also how college admissions work. You know, last year, we had this college admissions scandal with some parents going to 
great thanks to cheat on admission, <laughs> which is, uh, I, I think, just one more symptom of uh, this bottleneck of getting to the top colleges, really driving decisions in sometimes uh, extreme ways. So it is really about changing the environment. And if you change the environment, then you can have a change. Uh, and that I think is an important thing to know if you if you uh, look at some of these current outcomes and think they are problematic. Yeah. So, so if I understand this correctly, Matthias, so is it rational behavior, meaning the return on that activity is high, uh, activity, you know, the the kind of um, intensive parenting, so to speak, uh, the return on the activity is high. It's a rational behavior. Uh, but the reason for that to happen is uh, is because of the high um, variance and outcomes and the parent is really trying to push uh, the kid to exactly, a better exactly. outcome. Um, but do we have data to show that that um, that intensive parenting is is a high? We do. No, we, so we do see. Well, you know, again, as we said before, ideally you want experimental data. You can't really have that, but you can see. You can certainly yeah. see very clear associations between intensive parenting and measurable outcomes for children. So, for example, we see that uh, the children of more intense parents are more likely to graduate from college. They're in fact much more likely to get higher education, like a PhD. They're also more likely to be upwardly socially mobile, so to be in a higher social class, a higher income bracket, for example, than their parents were. So in terms of these measurable economic outcomes, uh, it does seem to work, which perhaps is not super surprising, you know, because you, this is exactly what you're trying to do to emphasize this uh, path towards education and, and measurable uh, success. Okay, okay. We'll take a quick break, Matthias, and when we come back, we talk about uh, the role of women's employment in a pandemic. Sounds great. Look forward to it. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. We are back. Um, Matthias, I want to now get to uh, some recent work. Um, it, it's entitled, This Time It's Different, The Role of Women's Employment in a Pandemic Recession but you're looking at um, what is different, um, especially the one that we are going through now related to COVID-19. And you said typically recessions affect men more than women, uh, but uh, this one is different, right? So, so why is it different and what can we learn from it? Yes, so it's, um, it's an important issue because there's uh, unequal impact of recessions on women versus men has arisen to be a large uh, factor just in the recent uh, two or three decades or so. So if you go back to the 50s, you know, most uh, families had a husband as a single earner and uh, so women did not play that much of a role in the labor force. But since then we have this trend towards uh, much more equal labor force participation of women and men. In fact, in uh, at the end of the previous year, at the end of 2019, for the first time, women were the majority of the labor force in the United States. Hmm. But then in recessions, uh, what has happened is that in recent recessions, uh, men have, in fact, lost many more jobs than, than women have. And the, the main reason for that, among uh, a couple of others, is that uh, there's large differences in which sectors women and men uh, work in and what kind of occupations they have. And so a typical recession usually hits uh, sectors such as construction and manufacturing very hard. And those are sectors with very high employment shares. Uh, so, so many men uh, get, off, uh, get laid off there, whereas uh, many women, for example, are in sectors such as uh, government, uh, education, uh, more broadly the service sector, which is a bit less dependent on business cycle fluctuations. And so for this reason, in a downturn, usually many more men get laid off. And this gives you this uh, phenomenon of a man session uh, in, in recent downturns. It was uh, perhaps the most pronounced in the Great Recession of 2007-2009, the financial crisis in its aftermath. And this is sort of a dual shock uh, on women, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there is a job-related shock that you talked about, but also uh, uh, people with kids. Um, women are more involved 
um, with kids. And if you don't have the ability to send them to school or daycare and things like that, that's also going to going to create an issue, right? Exactly. It's, it's really both those factors combined. So the first part is just checking where do women and men work and how are they affected. And there the difference is that a pandemic recession is totally different because of the reason that people get laid off is that you can't work because of the pandemic. This is most uh, pronounced in occupations that are what's called contact intensive, occupations that uh, involve directly dealing with other people, perhaps customers, so where the infection risk is potentially high. Now, those occupations shut down the fastest. You know, the classic example is restaurant business, uh, where there's a lot of direct contact that you want to avoid, uh, that you may have to avoid completely in a, in a shutdown. And so, so just in terms of uh, which workers were affected, uh, it was more women than men initially, so, so more layoffs to women, because uh, now the uh, most affected sectors are those service sector uh, occupations with very high female employment shares. But then we argue there's something on top of that, which is what you mentioned, is that uh, you also have closures of schools and daycare centers. So all of a sudden, the, the need for providing childcare has gone up for, for parents throughout the economy. This is made even worse because uh, informal childcare, such as childcare from grandparents, also becomes less available because social distancing means you probably want to keep some distance uh, with uh, older relatives uh, to keep them safe. So right. uh, now the question becomes, who is going to do all this childcare? And now we are uh, to the topic of gender inequality, that yeah. even though it has uh, gone down, the inequality has, uh, nowadays women still do the vast majority of, of childcare. It starts mm. with there being many more single moms and single dads, but also uh, within uh, couples raising children together, uh, women do uh, the majority of the work and therefore have been much more affected by this uh, uh, need for childcare and therefore a reduced availability to work. Hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at a chart um, and uh, just to give, give, uh, give everybody a rough idea, um, and so the, the, um, I, the, the chart I'm looking at, the difference between the rights in women's and men's unemployment, U.S. recessions between 48 and 2020. Uh, and so this is a differential between um, uh, men and women. Mm -hmm. And uh, for most recessions, this is negative, uh, meaning men, uh, men lost more jobs than women for most recessions. Uh, with some minor um, exceptions, like in 1961. I wonder what happened then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but in 2020, we have a huge, huge difference, about 2.9% difference. Um, and so this is not something the country has experienced yes. almost ever, right? Uh, has never experienced uh, this direction of change and also has never exchanged uh, just such a big difference between the two genders uh, in total. You know? so, so this is a, we call it a she session, so uh, a recession that affects women more. Uh, but the, uh, the gap between women and men in absolute terms is a lot larger than all the man sessions before. So we never have had in the past a recession that has affected one gender so much more than the other. Right. And you, you go through a model here. Um... But, but without the details, Mitya, so from a policy perspective, uh, how, how would you handle this? You know, clearly um, we've, been, we've been trying to get to an equal pay uh, for men and women for a long time. We are nowhere close to that. So that is sort of designed into the system. <laughs> um, and, and now we, we observe this phenomenon um, can we actually, um, you know, potentially change unemployment um, benefits or other policy interventions that make it uh, make it uh, make it less of a problem? That's right. Of course, you can't just remove the pandemic, uh, so so you have to deal with the consequences one way or the other. But there is many options for policies uh, on the menu, and in fact, you see a lot of variation across countries in what they do, and correspondingly, very different outcomes. So it starts with support. You mentioned unemployment insurance. The one uh, somewhat obvious thing to do there is to realize that uh, a lot of unemployment uh, or non-employment today is because of childcare. And so one thing you want to do is to uh, make it possible to draw unemployment uh, compensation, even though you are unable to work uh, because of childcare. And, 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 and uh, to be clear why that's something new, usually being unemployed requires looking for work, being available to work. So if you're not really looking for work, you can't really draw unemployment com uh, compensation. Usually this should be different now. 
this has been, in fact, one uh, component of the CARES Act, which is now expired. But for some time, uh, we did have that policy feature. Other countries had it too. Hmm. But it does, so, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. go ahead. So, so it doesn't stop there. So uh, a, a second thing to do is to think about how to get women back into employment. Uh, because yeah. at some point the crisis is over, we know from previous recessions that losing a job, really being out of work uh, in a recession has a very long term consequences for your earnings ability. It's hard to find a job, but it's also uh, even harder to find a job that had the same, say, career opportunities that you had previously. And so here policies that preserve employment, that essentially uh, subsidize employers to to uh, keep you on the payroll, at least formally during the uh, shutdown so you can come back uh, right after. Uh, they can be very successful in protecting those relationships. And again, they have been used just a little bit with the uh, small business uh, protection programs that the uh, government had here, which have now expired. Other countries have been much more aggressive and essentially uh, providing furlough pay so that unemployment wouldn't have to go up as much. And we do see that countries that have done that have seen a much smaller spike in unemployment than the United States. And the last mm. plank, which uh, is yeah. ultimately the most important one, is this issue of school closures. Now, of course, there's the health aspect, and we have to uh, figure out, is it safe for schools to be open? But in terms of the uh, economic repercussions, we see here this is, uh, in fact, tremendously important because, first of all, uh, for the overall economy, if you open schools, parents can work, so you free up labor supply. But it's also very essential for the gender inequality aspect. So if you were able to open schools uh, at that moment, uh, the gender inequality between women and men uh, during this recession would just uh, be much smaller. And of course, we're not advocating to just open schools uh, without any regard to health. That would be a bad idea, but it informs the trade-off. So if as all making you think about, should I prioritize opening bars and restaurants or should I prioritize opening schools? Now, that's a decision you can make. These are two alternative paths. And in the uh, United States, we have essentially chosen to uh, go first to bars and restaurants, which are still open, you know, around here, uh, where mm. schools are mostly closed. Other countries have made the opposite choice, and we argue it's ultimately better for the economy. It's uh, certainly much better uh, for uh, the future of gender inequality. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, so th this is sort of symptomatic, at least in my mind, um, or, you know, sort of a counting problem in the sense that uh, what a woman does uh, is not just uh, the work, uh, but she is more involved in the family, childcare, and things that we actually don't count in the GDP. Um, and and so when we think about, you know, when there is a shock and try to fix it, uh, we are borrowing metrics that doesn't really have the big picture of what actually goes on. And so if we try to, you know, try to um, reduce the impact, um, we cannot just look at the job. It sounds to me at least mm -hmm. we have to look at the family and, and what the net effect is going to be. Right. For sure. And uh, it's, it's, it's to some extent a measurement problem that we don't really, um, you know, take those uh, other very important things into account. And even just to say, you know, women are not working, of course, is, is really the wrong terminology to use because, uh, you know, the, the things you do at home as a parent, of course, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, you know, and, and somehow we just have decided to use the work for doing things uh, in the market. You know, but, but, but we do know that, of course, there's variation across families, but we do know that uh, on average, you know, nowadays, uh, mothers and fathers, uh, women and men have similar aspirations. You know, if, if they start out um, nowadays, uh, anybody almost uh, independently of gender uh, aspires to having uh, an own career, independent income and also to have a family. It just turns out that it's uh, much easier to combine those things uh, for men right now than for women because these uh, you know, leftover forms of gender inequality are still quite powerful. You know? And so you, uh, so you have to worry that uh, some of this progress that has been made in recent decades is, uh, is lost uh, in this crisis. Hmm. Yeah, so that, that's also an important thing to consider, right? So um, there is a systemic shock. And when we come out of this, we are not going to come out um, at the point where we started. We're going to come out somewhere completely different. That's right. <laughs> and so, yeah, so it's, it's not just taking care of the shock. It's really the aftershocks that need to be really thought through yeah. from a policy perspective. And we, and we uh, try to disentangle the different dimensions of that. And the, the most important one is the one we mentioned is that if you drop out of the labor force in a recession, you're going to have a harder time uh, getting back to the same spot. 
And this is something that tends to reinforce itself over time within families. You know? So if, if you think, think of a family that has maybe a couple of kids, uh, they were both working uh, full time, maybe with a similar pay uh, before the recession. But now think of a couple where now uh, during the recession, uh, the mom is the one who steps back and uh, is at home with the kids to do the homeschooling and, and the child care. You know, so if uh, the next time this couple has to make a decision, you should be moved to a new city, for example, because it's a better job for him versus for her. Uh, all of a sudden, his income is going to count for more because he now has become the primary earner. You know, so there's a there's a, a quite important possibility that that this becomes self-reinforcing. That once you fall behind, get more inequality. It leads to more specialization in the in the household. So, so men doing more market work, women doing more tasks at home. Uh, that that uh, makes this a really persistent shock, even if the crisis uh, is over. Now, against that, I, I do want to say that there's some other forces too. Uh, maybe yeah. one of the most important one is uh, work flexibility. Uh, so, so another thing that has happened is right. that now we've all learned to work from home. You know, be in the basement and uh, and <laughs> do our work on Zoom. Uh, yeah. And that is actually something that's. Uh, ultimately quite beneficial for families right? because uh, having little kids in particular requires flexibility, requires being able to uh, be home if a kid has a fever, to uh, leave a bit early if, uh, if they have to go to the doctor or be picked up for, for recital. And uh, so it's already clear now that flexibility will uh, stay with us afterwards. Many companies have announced they will uh, make work from home possible, some even uh, for everybody, uh, even after the crisis is over. And so this increase in work flexibility will benefit families. And given that women have now the majority of that burden, it will benefit them relatively more. So there's other forces too, but they will uh, take some time to really take over. Yeah, and that flexibility, a lot of, lot of different dimensions to that flexibility too, right? So if, if you lost a job in Detroit uh, pre, pre-COVID, um, you know, you looked to move, let's say, to Chicago. Yeah. Now there is an opportunity to to do exactly that, but without right. moving, mm-hmm. um, because both the employer and the employee, um, like you say, are used to used to doing that. So, do you see, you know, sort of the macroeconomic perspective? This flexibility will have a measurable positive yes, effect for, for sure. on the company. Uh, and as you say, these. Uh... Uh, so, so this issue, you know, do I have to move to somewhere somewhere else is important, but it's a particular big deal for couples. You know, if you if you think of uh, couples who, who both have careers, often if uh, one of them uh, takes a new opportunity, it means the other one has to step back. You know, you currently both have two jobs, say in Detroit. You know, if you uh, if you move to uh, Chicago because that's a great opportunity for him, then then often. Uh, uh, the spouse will not quite have the same opportunity. So, so the, the moving towards jobs creates more inequality. To some extent, also wastes some human capital right? because now uh, the spouse will not be matched with uh, as ideal a position as before. And if you can uh, remove some of these frictions by you know, doing work from home and it doesn't matter where we are, uh, that means both can be uh, well matched and, uh, and this force of inequality will be somewhat less powerful. So there's really some hopeful... Um, uh, stuff also coming out of this, this change in how we organize our work. Hmm. And I, I want to um, finish up with another paper that you have on a totally different topic. Uh, it's entitled, Why Didn't the College Premium Rise Everywhere? Employment Protection and On-the-Job Investment in Skills. And, and um, you say, why has a college wage premium risen rapidly in the United States since the 1980s, but not in European econ- economies such as Germany. Um, and so, so, so basically, you know, the college premium here is um, your ability to get a, a higher paying job, that differential uh, between um, what you get without a college education and with a college education, that differential has risen rapidly in the U.S., but not in Europe. So, 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 what, so, what do you find there? So, yes, and I, I should say, even though it's a different topic, it does relate to what we talked about uh, at the beginning, namely this uh, these changing inequality trends that also drive our parenting choice. And we think of this as one mm-hmm. one part of the institutional background that that goes into this. So we see this different yeah. differential trend that the college graduates in the United States are doing very well relative to everybody else. Uh, in Germany, it's uh, it's a lot more equal across the education scale. And a lot of the literature in economics on this is really about what is special about college. You know, so the typical story about why the college premium is high 
have to do with this idea, for example, there's new technology such as you know, computers, the internet, and this notion that uh, people with more education are just better at adopting to these new technologies. So it's really about something being uh, different about uh, what college education means for your productivity. But what we argue is that this uh, doesn't really work so well because uh, you know computers uh, have spread in Europe too, they've spread in Germany, yet you don't see the same trend. And so what we uh, try to point attention to is the skills, not of the college graduates, but the skills of those that do not go to college. And here our notion is that uh, in a country like Germany, there's a system that, uh, that ends up uh, providing quite advanced skills also to people who go to a more vocational training route and work for companies often for, for, for many years uh, at the same employer. Whereas uh, this, uh, the, same, the same setup of having uh, jobs that don't require college education, but that still provide skills and uh, let you accumulate experience, that these jobs have become less plentiful in the United States and therefore have in fact reduced the opportunities for people without college education. So, so employment protection in this context is the inability of an employer to uh, to terminate That's employment, right. mm -hmm. uh, or that the yeah. cost of termination is too high. Uh, exactly, and and it, it's always a trade off because if you make uh, it impossible to fire people, uh, you're not going to have uh, firms create any jobs. You know, for example, uh, India is an example of that where you have very high employment protection, but then you get very little formal employment because you know employers are hesitant to, to create those jobs. But generally speaking, you have uh, very little employment protection in the United States. Um, and then we argue, well, uh, what this means for your relationship to your employer depends a bit how stable the economic environment is overall. You know? So if, um, if you're in a fairly stable environment where companies can plan for decades ahead, it doesn't really matter that much because there's still an expectation to have a long-term relationship. So, so, so what you should have in mind is uh, think of, uh, say, a high school graduate who starts working for, say, GM or AT&T or IBM in the 60s. You know? So it's a, it's a job without employment protection, but it's still a job where you probably expect to be with this company for, for many years. And therefore, there's a lot of incentive for both sides to invest in that relationship, you know, for, the, for the worker to really uh, accumulate skills you need for this job. Also, for the, for the companies to uh, create the kind of jobs to create work conditions that reward accumulation of skill. And so you get a workforce that, is, uh, that has a lot of firm specific experience, is productive and therefore you know, warrants a higher salary. But, but is there a difference in employment protection uh, for um, variety of employees, you know, the low skill mm -hmm. employees opposed to high skill employees? So um, you know, that, that's something that, that varies across, uh, across countries. In the United States, generally there's uh, almost no formal protection. You can get a contract as yeah. long term, but, but uh, by, by law, uh, you can be fired at, uh, at any time. In, uh, in, in Germany, other countries, uh, again, there's a variety of different, different rules, but there are rules in place, for example, seniority rules that make it difficult to fire people, especially if they have been uh, at a given employer for, for a longer period of time. So, so in, in, in practice, as a, as a long-term employee in Germany, you have a lot of employment security, of course, unless your firm goes under, and then, then well, that's a different story. Right. Are, are the wages um, approximately the same between the U.S. and Germany for for different types of so, employees? So they have diverged a bit, you know. So the, the big observation yeah. in, uh, in the United States is that even though wage growth on average has been, you know, reasonably strong in recent decades, there has been almost no real wage growth for workers below median income. So if you look at the, the bottom half of, right. of U.S. workers, depending on how you account for inflation, there is either no or very little uh, progress in, in real purchasing power. And that at face value is quite surprising because productivity has been going up. You know? so, so, uh, so you wonder, well, why aren't they getting paid more? The answer that we are giving is that the uh, composition of jobs has shifted. That in, the, in the 60s and 70s, there were still more jobs that were career jobs, not really you know, for college educated workers, for high school educated workers, but still long-term careers to give an employer with a high premium uh, at, the, at the end of their employment. Whereas nowadays, uh, there's more short-term employment and often employment that requires very little skills. You know, if you work for uh, you know, McDonald's or in many service sector jobs, you have jobs where you can learn the job in, uh, in one or two days and that's as much as there is to learn. There is really no, 
long-term accumulation of experience uh, and skills. And so we argue that this, uh, this change in the composition of jobs towards uh, jobs that require less skills and therefore pay less is a reaction to some extent to change the economic environment, but the combination of that with a different uh, regime for employment protection. Mm. Uh, um, but I also wondered, you know, um, I don't know if this is this is the case, but just for argument's sake, if if the U.S. is applying technology at a higher level, um, let's say, you know, technologies like robotics and artificial intelligence, you will see a sharp increase in college premium mm -hmm. uh, because in the you know, lower part of the that spectrum is either going to be not having jobs or their their power um, of wages eroding so so could we could we explain this by just you know sort of the the application of technology mm -hmm. difference yes yeah, so that certainly can be a factor now if, uh, if one country becomes a lot more high tech more than the other that would play a role uh, of course, also the relative supply yeah. of grades also plays a role. You know? so we're not denying that this might be one of the forces uh, that is there, but we at the same time argue that if you look at high tech, uh, in fact, a place like Germany is really not that different. You know, There's a lot of automation, a lot of uh, technology, a lot of uh, robotics also used, uh, used in Germany. And, uh, and these stories do not explain why it is that uh, the wages of uh, below million workers in the United States have stagnated. You know? So there's really no, uh, no reason to expect, even if the high tech workers do more, that uh, the less educated workers wouldn't at least be uh, getting wages growing at the rate of overall productivity. So it really does suggest there's some erosion of uh, skill accumulation that was there before. And, uh, and our uh, you know, paper tries to provide one possible explanation for that. Okay. And so, so the sort of the overarching uh, observation here is that employment protection uh, has a big impact on mm -hmm. inequality trends. Um, and I want to be very clear that uh, we are not uh, understanding this or, or pushing this as a as a clear endorsement of employment protection. Because I mean, there's a long literature and it's very clear that excessive employment protection can be very harmful. You know, if you make it too hard to fire people, there will be a little less, uh, less hiring. And you see the ill effects in many countries. For example, there is... Uh, Places like Spain and France, where youth unemployment is extremely high, uh, young people have a very hard time finding jobs to some extent because there's an overregulation. You know, so there's definitely a trade-off. But what we are we, we are making the argument that it's not all uh, a bad idea; that there can be some uh, useful interaction of a, a moderate level of protection and and a better environment for the accumulation of skills for for workers. Yeah, so that that's a complex <laughs> optimization sure, sure. problem, right? So, the the so the, the more employment protection there is in a in a country, um, the less attractive, um, relatively speaking, are to get to higher skills, higher education, because the premium doesn't rise that's as right. fast, mm -hmm. uh, and, and hence um, the long term effects. Of, uh, of employment protection uh, could be um, lower um, per capita high education uh, or higher education, I should say. You could have a, a somewhat less education. In fact, if you look at the difference the US Germany again, you do find that Germany does have fewer college graduates. So, so that's consistent with what you're proposing. But I think what you have to look at is uh, at the inefficiencies. And when you propose policies as an economist, you're looking for, is there something inefficient? Is there some externality that is going on? You know, and, and we are arguing that there is some uh, uh, inefficiencies in contracting. It's difficult to write, you know, really a complete long-term contract between works and firms, and that uh, a moderate level of protection can uh, can get you around some of those inefficiencies and therefore get you closer to the best conditions you could have for accumulation of skills. Are there um, sort of simple, simpler policies a country could consider to, to sort of get to, not precisely to yeah. the optimum level, but closer to it? No, so I, I think uh, you can also ask the question, is there something we can do with more formal education? You know, so in the United States, we have uh, uh, mm -hmm. schools, we have high schools, we provide a lot of uh, education in colleges. Compared to other countries, we do relatively less for people who want to go on, but but not necessarily to college. So I'm thinking about things like vocational training, like um, yeah. uh, apprenticeships, you know, which are uh, very characteristic of the 
uh, of the German system. You know, nowadays, we have an environment where yeah. in the United States, about 60% of each cohort do not graduate from college. The majority uh, do not get a college degree. Uh, but we do not really have a, a very clear system that, that says, well, how are we going to uh, provide skills to, to this population? You know, we, we are very focused on college, not so much on the, on the other part. And so, so I think policies that provide more paths towards vocational training, ideally involving the uh, business sector, involving apprenticeships, for example, I think that's a, it's a big missing part and that would be a good place to start for counteracting some of these trends. Yeah, so, so I want to just uh, finish up with a, with, a, with a question that's not in the paper. Uh, so do you think um, a system like Germany where you have apprenticeship as an alternative, um, do you think such a system is, is more resilient in a mm -hmm. shock? Uh, yes, I do think so, because uh, it is about uh, relationships. It keeps relationships between, between the business sector and workers uh, intact. These apprenticeships provide skills. They are not really very highly paid. You know? So it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively low cost way for uh, businesses to uh, get connected to workers to uh, help them accumulate skills and, uh, and have a workforce to draw on uh, later on. And I think in downturns, it is quite successful. We see this also when we compare across European countries that uh, youth unemployment in Germany is just a lot less uh, reactive to uh, the business cycle, say, compared to uh, uh, France or Spain or Italy. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Matthias. Uh, thanks so much for spending thanks time. Thanks for having me on. This was a lot of fun. And a good, yeah, good Thank luck you. with this research. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.